Reporting in progress. I don't know. The one that was there or not? Yeah. yeah. I think that's the right one. We do have a different one. I think that was, yeah, there. I don't know. You should have a different one. Oh, yeah. I know I'm got to figure it out. Okay. 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 Here's a picture of 
It's fine. You sit wherever you want. They're still. Yeah, she got to play Yes, our October 1st is really today. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. I'm glad you all remember it was tonight. <laughs> I was thinking about talking, who knows? Uh, so do not be alarmed by my phone sitting in the middle. Somebody said audio is really bad, so I'm trying to use that as a microphone to pick up more people talking. So people wanted to hear the feedback, and so wanted to be sure we, I'm trying. So it's, it's an art form to get this just right. As soon as I get it just right, I'll decide to do something totally different, right, Deborah? <laughs> Um, so, uh, also, I need to precursor this with, uh, I went to uh, the eye doctor today, and uh, he dilated me this morning, and I'm still in a rough state, uh, so I don't know, how, I probably will not read anything out of the Bible, because that's way too small print right now. Uh, so, uh, if I am squinting and doing this, don't make fun of me, Elisa. It is... <laughs> uh, so I apologize for that, but uh, so we are going to continue to push uh, push forward in this uh, this study as we talk about faith, and uh, tonight we have the opportunity to talk about Naaman. Uh, so we we kind of we talked about Abraham, and then we went off to of him, and now we're on Naaman. So tonight. Uh, I, I find it interesting. Faith without fireworks. I don't know that faith can be fireworkless. I think our faith always has a spark going somewhere, but it'll be interesting to see. Tonight we'll be in uh, Second Kings, uh, so when we get to that, that's the chapter we're on uh, tonight. So, kind of the, the story that they start with, uh, maybe. Alisa, what? can you read this? Yeah, can you come here? 
we all. I can read the questions because those are only one line, but can you start out the uh, the story for us, please? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Let's read that. This one? Yeah. Okay. When Halley's Comet passed by the Earth in 1985, at least one person was disappointed. He said it wasn't like 75 years before when he distinctly remembers hearing it go whoosh as it rushed past. In 1996, the comet Hyakutake passed closer to the Earth than any comet in known history. Appearing as a blurry star, it disappointed those who expected a fiery display in the sky. When we tried to point out the Hyakutake to some junior hires, they said, yeah, sure, uh -huh. I got back in the car. Our expectations of faith often resemble our expectations of comments. We hunger to see God do spectacular things, when instead, God calls us to quiet acts of obedience. We say, yeah, sure, and lose interest. Thank you. Here we go. So, when you, when have you been blessed by someone's very simple or quiet action in life? Say that again. When have you been blessed by someone's very simple or quiet action? I think having someone bring me food when I was, you know, in bed. Couldn't get up. <laughs> okay. That sounds simple, you know, we all could, so but I thought it was really nice. And, yeah. and it was kind of simple. My mom had never bought me any food, and when she seen it, she thought, oh, that was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I thought it was pretty nice. <laughs> Anyone else? I think maybe a call. Um, like she said, when you're not feeling well or have surgery or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So as we kind of then take that and look at, at tonight, um, there was a Syrian army commander, as we're about to read about, who once sought help from uh, the prophet Elijah. He expected a show, but he was disappointed. At first, well, let's dive into this. Second Kings, the fifth chapter, verses one through fifteen. Would anybody volunteer to read that? I'll read it. Thank you. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord has given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back a captive young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were here with the prophet who is, from, who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master saying, Thus and thus, said the girl, who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And then it happened, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make a lie, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to me, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me and he shall know that there is profit in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot 
And he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the jar seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Harbar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet has told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, and he said all his aids, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. So suppose you are Naaman. At which point in this story would you most be tempted to just quit? When he didn't come out. Oh. And, and he was the first time. First time, okay. When things don't go as you think they should, you get discouraged and you say, I'm done. So, on the other side of that, what would keep you going with your name? Well, thinking that if I do what he asked me to do, if he was clean, that's what he was wanting. So if he did it, right. know, and maybe clean, that would, it would be good. Yeah, uh, maybe sure, sheer determination, right? Eventually, something's going to happen, right? We're going to have fireworks, right? So. What is remarkable then about the young servant girl's response to Naaman's uh, leprosy? Go back to verse two and three. That'll give us a little. What what do we find remarkable remarkable about uh, this servant girl's response? To just speak up and tell her mistress this, being a servant, that she didn't have courage to speak up. Hey. Say, uh, this is the proper thing. Uh, this is very true. That you would be healed. Yeah. And she had faith that he could heal. I think it's a it's a big combination to that, right? Because in biblical times, especially Old Testament times, if you were a servant, there, there was not a lot of chat going on. You didn't speak up, and you didn't say things. Um, and so I think there's a lot of courage, there's a lot of faith, and it's just this resounding, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it, see what happens, right? So what approach then did Naaman initially take towards getting um, getting this problem solved? Well, what was kind of this first approach that he used? And he thought he could just stay there and not or not go and end this all moment. He was upset that it didn't wasn't gonna right. be on his terms. Well he took all these gifts that if he thought that he needed by his <laughs> cleansing because right. he had all these gifts. Yes, sir. I mean, ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold. You know, he's got all this clothing, and so he's like, "Hey, something's gonna happen. Look at all this stuff I have." Right? 
right? That's that's kind of his first thought, right? It's, that's got to be his you know, that's that's gonna get some, yeah, something's gonna happen, right? Right. You go back to verse four, right? Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Interesting. Thus and thus. He didn't even want to say exactly what she said. Just, hey, she was talking. She's from Israel and not supposed to do this. Can I please go? You know? Uh, so then, when, when we look at this, like, go to verse 7. And in verse 7, the question then comes how did the king of Israel's reaction uh, complicate his quest? Said, oh my God, I can't do this. Right? I mean, he's he tore his clothes and says, you know, cons I mean, there's this, it, it's like a wall comes up. It's like, you know, I have faith that this girl says what she, you know, this is what I need to do, and I I'll I'll be cleansed and I'll be clean, and all of a sudden now the, the king's like, eh? No, watch this. Um, you know, right? How how do I do this? I I don't. I can't do this. Well, the tearing of the clothes wasn't that anger. Yeah, that's some sort of significance in the Bible. Anger, show of anger. So the the tearing of robes was a a sign of it was a sign of mourning. Is what they said. Um, right, that the king of Israel at uh, that time was apparently um, right, I'm trying to tell you exactly what he was the he was the son of, so that king was the son of uh, another. Yes. <laughs> you might as well just sit. It's nice to be what it is, isn't it? I guess. Does that what? Really small print. Oh, that is. The Terry Rose was signed in morning. The king of Israel at this time was apparently Joram, son of the infamous Ahab. He was killed later by Jehu while recovering from wounds. He received in a battle with the king of Tamar. So he was just essentially he's an angry king, right? He's just, I, I'm not going to do this. I can't do this. How do I do this? And and so here is Naaman, like wondering what what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? So then, as we push a little further in, we look at verses uh, 8 through 10, and we ask ourselves, then, how did Elijah, who was the prophet, right, um, involve himself into his problem now? You know, why have you torn your clothes, right? Let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. He kind of becomes the, the interceder of faith here, right? He steps in, and he's, you know, very much, um, he'll go and wash in the River Jordan. Um, your flesh shall be restored. He has this voice, right? This this image that says, hey, this king isn't doing anything, but come here, I, I'll help you. You know, so he kind of involves himself in just simply being, what, the solution to the problem. He knows how he's going to heal. And how does Naaman react to that? Yeah. 
Yeah. He's angry. He became, what, verse 11, became furious. He didn't even come out. All right, so we're back to this rebellious state, right? So I have a question. Yeah. How do you think Elisha heard about tearing the clothes? It just says that he heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes, but who from, how? It doesn't tell us what it was your best guess. Well, if Elijah truly is a prophet, my guess is that he was either very close to where this king was, or as soon as Naaman was away from the king, he was, you know, distraught. And, and for all we know, Elijah heard from God what had happened. And God said, now this is what I need you to do. Um, that is the one thing that has always intrigued me about the Bible is it will say somebody heard this. Somebody was doing this in reaction to this, but we don't know how that happened. You know, uh, but I think that again is, I guess if you want to tie it to what we're at in Bible study, it ties us to faith, right? Yep. Faith is in that, okay, here Elijah knew about this, and now because of that, God is using him uh, to, to take Naaman and, and cleanse him, right? So let me ask you this then. When have you wished that God would just do something dramatic in response to your faith? I think sometimes we need to be patient and if you're praying for someone to go ill to recover or get better. You wonder why they're not. Mm -hmm. I always think it should be the end of the year. There should be a big old party or, <laughs> or fireworks. I have been to church at Sunday. I have prayed. I have read my Bible. It has been all year. There should be a big old something at the end of the year. How do you feel when it's not? <laughs> I'll still do it the next year. <laughs> because you have what? Faith. Faith. Because we have faith, right? Even in those moments where we feel like God is supposed to light off fireworks and send in a marching band and, and give us presents to the Lord, we have faith that no matter what the outcome of what we're dealing with and in the moment we're dealing with it, that God will still provide because I don't know even, I look at my faith journey, I don't know that there's ever truly been fireworks gone off. There have been some great things in my faith journey that have happened, but I don't know that it was the marching band and parade down Main Street that was like, ha ha, you won the grand prize. And really, isn't that what Naaman's trying to get here? He's wanting to get the attention. Right. He's. He's wanting the fireworks of, of faith. It's like, I put faith in coming. I, I did this. I, I went to the king, and now here's this Elijah guy saying, go. Go take a little skinny dip in the river Jordan, and you'll come out looking nice. But when it's the messenger of Elijah, he came out and told him to go walk to the river Jordan. Right. He sends, he sent a messenger through Elijah. So this comes through a line. You know, a messenger says, go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you. I think Tame. Well, Tame it was. It was serious. Right? He was, seven times. There's a lot to be said about so biblically they say seven is this I mean, there's the Seven. If you look at Revelations, and 
Revelations is seven is used to kind of seven times 70. It's God saying that it's almost an infinite amount. And it, it's a popular number. <laughs> you know, you get number lucky seven. That's why people say lucky seven. And I think that's a tribute because God repeatedly over and over used seven as kind of this, you know, magic, not magic, this miracle or the, the blessing happened around seven. Um, and um, it would be interesting to dive into that a little bit more, and I, I, might, I might do that. Um, but you look at, when we talk in Revelations, there's the, the seven uh, heavens, and, and then you get the, the seven bridesmaids, right? The seven Right, yeah. and so seven is kind of this reoccurring thing. So I think this is part of God going seven. Tell this man seven times. I don't know what would happen if he only went in six. Right, right. Seven in the Bible often symbolizes completion, perfection, exoneration, healing, and fulfillment of promises. Google. <laughs> <laughs> it's my best friend. <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, but so there, you know, so this Naaman is coming into this going, one, the king did nothing for me. Two, this now this Elijah guy sends this messenger to uh, I'm supposed to go in seven times. It's like, I don't I think I might have given up at that point too. But how many times do I have to do something? I bring all my stuff, that doesn't matter, right? The king says, I can't do this, go away. This messenger now says that I'm supposed to do this again. Where is his faith taking him? Where would your faith take you in this? Big question here, yeah. And why do you think it's that why can't I go? You know, why can't I go down the road to the river over here? Right. And I'll be fine. Well, I think ultimately we why know why to do it, Jordan. Right? Oh, yeah. That's what he's thinking, though. Why? Right. Why do I have to go over here? I have to go all the way over to Jordan. Why won't the other two work? Well, he was a commander. He was probably used to getting his way. Right. And now he's not getting his way, right? So here he is, the, the one that's this commander. All of a sudden, nobody's listening to him, right? Now he, all of a sudden, is the one that's supposed to do um, all the, the listening. So if you look at verse 13, how did Naaman's uh, servant uh, show wisdom in this? Not just honestly. I think that maybe Naaman thought he had to do something much more involved and much more important than going to the river and dipping himself seven times. That wasn't quite a big enough kind of fireworks. There really are. That wasn't a big enough fireworks to get his nerve. Where's my parade? Yeah. That's that's true. I mean, you look at it that way. Maybe he thought going in the river seven times wasn't grand and glorious. Wasn't, you know, all of a sudden the lights or cloud comes around him and circles him and then poof, there it is. He did his will and kneeling to him or whatever, so he kind of thought he needed a little bit more room. He had been in control. Yes. So where in your life have you been in control of something and then that control you, you didn't have it anymore? Where, where would your faith take you? Much like this, say you were, say you were naming and you were in command of something and all of a sudden now you're being told you have no control. Have you had those kinds of moments in your life? I think that's just 
I think I think you had illnesses or you've been with someone who's had illnesses and you are told by the medical physicians that <laughs> this is all we can do and you your faith you think, oh Lord, but I pray I I you know ask you to do this. You start questioning. Um, so I think, and there are other situations too, but I think when you're seeing someone go through the situations and you say, okay, this is it. Someone has cancer or whatever. We can't do any more. This is it. Mm -hmm. So you have to accept that. And I that's in the Lord's prayer. But yet you prayed and prayed and prayed for them to get better. And it was a good person, they did everything right. And you feel like God didn't answer your prayer because they died. But God has a plan that we know. That's true. Plan to give. Sure. I guess it's all in yeah. God's plan, but still, it's about faith, trusting in God. But say, your will, but not mine. It's hard. That is. I mean, and when you say the prayer, right? Do you? I, I often say this when I, when I talk about like things we do in worship, right? Do we just say the Apostles' Creed and we just say it? We don't sit and really think about it? Do we just say it because, oh, it's printed there and this is what I'm saying? Or when you say it, do you truly say, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Do we say things just out of habit? Or do we truly mean that? Like the Lord's Prayer, when you are saying, Thy will be done, you're, when you're saying it's not me, it's you, right, God? I think there's a, there's some Sundays that, of course, everybody is like, I am so tired. I'm first time. But, oh. but mm -hmm. sometimes I'm a little bit injured. It's hard. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you find then your faith in that where you just feel like you come to church and all I did was just I said everything I was supposed to say. Where 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 do you find then strength in coming out of that worship service? Do you find it right then? Do you find it later? I'm I'm curious. I think you have to go back and hear three minutes in the bathroom that's so you get by yourself with a small children. If you get that and Try to find it there. I think it's hard if you're the, you know, the per the people that are busy doing a lot of stuff. I, you know, for years I was always the one giving communion and doing the offering and all that kind of stuff. And the first Sunday, I could just sit there and take communion. It was just, I just still remember the feeling. It, it finally meant something. Instead of, like she says, you know, for years you're wrangling kids and <laughs> doing all that kind of stuff. Sometimes, yeah, you lose why you're there. It's one thing that I always found I would do in ministry, whether I was directing church choirs or preaching, I said, I have to find something in this service that touches me. So I I strive. Now, I will be honest, there are times that I will come out of Sunday and not really have felt worship. And when I tell myself I did not feel worship, I just felt like I was going through the motions of what I was supposed to go through, that's when I have to stop and say to myself, God, find me right now. Find me, strengthen my faith, show me something that I can connect with. And so I, I challenge you a little bit in that is if you come out of worship 
And we have those Sundays, right? At least it's right. We get those Sundays where we, we just go through the motions and we leave church. But if you find yourself back at your car or back home and just going, I don't know what I got out of that today. I wonder why he said so they find just a song or hymn or the hymns tell the story. They do. And the words to the hymns will help them get to it sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, there's times I preach a sermon and I'm not cussed as much as I am when we sing a hymn. Or, you know, during that the moment of, of my alone time. I say my alone time in front of all of you, but the the times where we're collecting the offering, that is my one time that I sit and I, I just find myself in those two and a half, three minutes with God. That's my one time in, in worship to go, God, find me. You know, and so I, I challenge you in in your own faith journey. If you are in moments of worship or you're, uh, maybe it's not even here, maybe it's something where, where you feel like you're participating, but you don't know how God is leading you. Maybe just a simple prayer, God, find me right now and lead me into something. There are times where you're not going to like the sermon. It's just, it's not going to connect with you. Maybe there's other times that in that sermon, the Spirit moves you beyond belief. I, I had somebody after church on Sunday that said to me, he said, that was one of the most powerful sermons I've ever heard you preach. Because you really touched something. I don't know what it was that was touched. I don't know how the Spirit moved in them. But that was that message they needed. I've heard that another time. And I'll be honest, sometimes some of you just come and shake your head and go, I'm not 100 percent sure what you did. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, there are some folks who shake my head that are vocal on that. That one was not good, Pastor. <laughs> Have a good week. We'll see you next time. Try again. Uh, sometimes that first is that one sitting over there. But <laughs> I you asked for my opinion. <laughs> but it's I'm a, not, I'll give it to you. I'm not. About that faith journey, you know, I, as a, you know, much like Naaman, I, I feel there are times where I, I, I have, and I, by no means I'm a commander, but there's this command presence in worship, right? You look to the pastor to lead you through and to guide you through, uh, and as I shake hands on Sunday, and some people are like, no. You kind of go, wait, what? What do you mean, no? You know how hard I worked on that sermon? You know how much I put into this worship? And then I go, maybe that's it. Maybe that's my God moment today. You know? Um, but on the other hand, you have people come and say, well, that sermon was just for me. I don't know if anybody even meant for anybody else, but I got the whole thing, you know. It, 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 um, at least, I will be honest, at least once a week, there's one person that comes out of that church that says, I needed that. Yeah. Now, I don't often know, know what they needed, <laughs> but I either I needed that in a good way, or I needed that to determine whether you should still be the pastor here. I don't know, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Don't it you is, think different people get different things out of it? Yeah. They do. Oh, yeah. And I'll be I can write a sermon. Just ask me. I will. I will sit. I will write the sermon. I will go through it, and then well, you could ask Deborah. I tell her four times a week. But <laughs> that was bad. I, I I put it all together, and then Saturday night I go through this sermon, and I go, "This is where God's leading me." And then Sunday was a prime example. I looked down at the paper, and I went, "That's not what God wants me to say." And in that moment. I I said, where is faith taking? Where is faith taking all of these people? My hope is that you're all getting something out of these messages. My hope is that you are finding faith that you rely on God more and more as you go through your faith journey. But the reality is, 
we may wind up like Naaman at some point and just go, no, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't. And that's when we come back to God, right? That's when we take this leap of faith, much like Naaman eventually does, right? He eventually listens. But, um, well, I think, too, it is, it is your level of participation, your level of presence, uh, being involved in what's going on, paying attention. Uh, and Josh said this week that that sermon was going to be a hard one because he just really, it was a hard passage of scripture, difficult, and I said, you'll find it. It will come to you, did not. That's what I, I said to him. I said, it's still not sure it came to me. Sometimes it doesn't come until Sunday morning, but, <laughs> but, and just like when we're talking about Satan and Creed, do we just say the words, or do we put any feeling into it? Do we put any emphasis in it? Are we really thinking about those words? And you, you got to put something into it. I mean, you're not the magician who's going to get a, give us everything that maybe we need without us being involved in being able to accept that. Right. So, we have to be in. Well, she takes the ball. She probably gets it later. <laughs> later, <laughs> yeah, it goes And I sometimes take them so I can see them participate. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because sometimes we got to go to the back. Yes. You know, the whole time. Because and, and like I have. Told you over and over again. What do I say? Don't leave your faith where? On the doorpost. When you leave, you don't do that. But in retrospect, when you come in, you've got to bring it with you. You've got to bring your faith with you. What is it that brings you to church on Sunday? I, 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 honestly, what uh, yeah. Sunday morning rolls around, what is it that brings you to church on Sunday? Yeah. Married to the past. <laughs> <laughs> It would look bad if we did it. I'll follow that. My boss will expect me to. <laughs> 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 right? We were not in the front row of that lady. But what is that thing that when, when you get to Sunday and you have an option, you have an option of not, but what is that one thing that brings you? What, what is it? Is it the fellowship? Is it the building that you want to see? Is it the people you want to talk to? I want to hear what God has to say through you. So in turn, it's what? It's faith. Hey, your faith brings you you could stay home. Yes. But the week is not right. Unless yeah, you don't feel like the start of the week now. Right. I mean, when you've gone since you were a baby, that's just what you do on Sunday. Yeah. Really? And then you learn that it's not just because mom and dad said I had to, it's because I want to. That's what I was looking for. Just because we do it all the time, are we getting up and going, it's Sunday, old, old robot, here I go. Or are we going because our faith is so deeply rooted in us that no matter what is going on in life, it is worship is where I need to be. Now, it may be that worship is in the sanctuary. It may be that you aren't here on a, you can't physically be here, but you find worship somewhere. It's your faith that drives you. It's this dependence on God that drives you. Much like I think in all in all in Naaman, there was a, a drive, right? This one, he was a commander, so I don't think he was easily going to give up. Even though he may have wanted to, there was a drive. And so we find that drive in ourselves when it comes to our faith journey. He wanted to be healed. Well, he wanted to be healed. Don't we want to be healed? Whether that's mind, body, or spirit, we want to find healed. So, Picture then yourself as Naaman. As you begin to immerse yourself into the Jordan these seven times, you go under and you come up the first time. You go under and you come up the second, the third, the fifth, the sixth. 
What are your fears and your hopes as you come out of that water every time? What if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't work? Then what am I supposed to do? Or I really hope this does work. I believe it's going to work. Faith that it is. I don't know. Maybe I'd come up and go, What if this does work? Now, what do I do with my life? I've spent my life with leprosy, right? I've been an outcast in some places. I may have been a commander, but what if this does work? Now, what do I do with my life? My Bible puts no word leprosy. Uh, so the Hebrew word was used for various diseases affecting the skin, not necessarily lepers. Right. So I mean, he could be scarred by something. Could have the hives. Could have hives. Right. To uh, cure yourself. So Naaman was healed physically. There was this physical healing. What spiritual changes took place within him then as a result of that? What was that physical healing? What spiritually happened to him? Recognize that it's more God, the God of the Israelites. Yeah. Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. He, he realizes that that's it, right? That there is truly a God. The chief God of, of all, right? This, this God that I just need to put my trust in. Obedience. Huh? Obedience. Obedience, right? I think sometimes in our faith journey we we lack that obedience to what God is calling us to do. You know, I can look back at the last series of sermons I've preached and I've asked a lot of hard questions. And I go back and I ask them again of myself. Am I obedient to those things that Jesus says? I no, because why? Because I'm sinner, right? We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. But we need to strive and push our faith and our dependence on God to know that what we do in our life is about Jesus and what He did for us. What we do in our life must be reflective of. That love language, right? I opened the sermon this week by saying it's not the love language we've been so used to hearing, right? Jesus talks about loving each other and forgiving each other and taking up a cross and being glorious. And now here this week he said to us, pluck your eye out, put your hand off, take your foot off. But in turn, it can kind of be like where we're going in our, our text tonight and saying, those things that we aren't obedient to, we must be because God provides for us in the end. God provided for Naaman, right? Cleansed him of whatever it was that he had going on. Didn't do it on the first time out of the water. Okay, now what? Second time, I'm not so sure. Fifth, sixth. He comes up that seventh time. And it was God that revealed everything to him. Was it a glorious firework like he wanted, like the commander insisted? No, but it was exactly what he asked for, just in a way that he didn't expect to get to that. And that is a lot like us on our faith journey. We try to steer, right? We, no, we see God, I'm not thinking Missouri is the right place to go. <laughs> I don't, I, I think I honestly told Lisa at one point, Missouri? 
you know, I'm being honest, a friend of mine said, Mr. B, not Mr. B. That friend had to be a pastor, so we won't go down that path, but anyway. <laughs> but I, I was then obedient to the call, right? As much as I didn't want to be, as much as I wasn't sure that that was the call, I in turn said, God, I, I trust in you. I, I have that faith in you. And I'll be honest, I, I am so very blessed to have truly followed God's call. And I think we do that in our lives, right? We, whether it's the small things, whether it's the kids aren't listening to me, I shouldn't say this to them, I shouldn't say that, you know, or work is really causing me issues. I got a boss that's just unrelentless. <laughs> we have to have that thing. So that's what I, that's what I, I truly want to instill in you is to say that, you know, have the faith that brings you through what you need to go through, even if it's not what you want, right? Naaman didn't get everything he wanted, but he still pushed through. So that I ask last... you a, a semi-related question. Yes. Yeah. Top of my head. So we're talking about that it wasn't the fireworks. Can you maybe give us an example in the from the Bible that you think was a fireworks moment? Jesus on Calvary. Besides that. Besides <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, Noah in the ark. That was a firework moment. Um, Moses when the Red Sea was parted. I guess you could call that a firework moment. Okay. Uh, when. Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho, and the wall came tumbling down. I'm a busted the song. <laughs> I think those were firework moments, but then there were those faith moments that weren't. Adam and Eve, some would say it was a firework moment for the wrong firework, but it was a moment where faith was starting to push through, right? It was this, now this dependence on God becomes more and more. But then there were those, you know, really, in turn, was Noah in the ark a firework moment? Because what did God do? He eliminated everything. Well, I guess it was a God firework moment, right? But there are those moments where we can say faith I had tons of fireworks. And in your own life, maybe there are those faith moments that you've had that were firework moments. I would love to say my confirmation was a firework moment in my life because I worked so hard. I pushed so hard in my faith. You know, um, I will ultimately tell you when I become fully ordained, that will indeed be a firework moment in more ways than one. But our faith doesn't always have to have those firework moments. It's great when it does. And maybe the firework that happens is that very simple thing that you don't think is a firework, but God does. That moment where you find relief from that pain or you have four minutes alone. <laughs> Those are firework moments to God. To you, it's just, ah. Maybe that's the challenge. Find the fireworks in the moments where you think it's just God being God. Is there firework in that moment? So the the. the Last thing I want to leave you with is this. In what area of your life do you think God waits for you to take a small step of obedience so he can show you that he truly is God? Oh. <laughs> Maybe that's a question you just hold on to this week. Maybe that's that's the aha moment that you'll find at some point. Say it again, please. In what area 
of your life do you think God want, waits for you to take a small step of obedience so that he can show you that he is truly God? Yes, dear? Yeah. I think my mom has always said, like, you know that old saying where sometimes a door closes and a window opens. My mom has always said it a little different. There's always going to be another door. And she always says, you just have to have the faith to step through that door. You have to be able to take that small step. You know, it may change your life. It may not change your life. It may be just a very small thing, but it may be a huge thing. But you have to be willing to take that you know, take the door on the right, not the door on the left. I've tried to always follow that advice best I can. Other thoughts? I think when we're asked to do things, um, job lines, church lines, Personal lives, wise, that you know, oh God, I really don't want to do that. I don't, I really want, I don't want to do that. And I think that he insists that we have the faith to step out and go across that room and talk to somebody you've never met before. Or if you see someone having a problem in the grocery store who needs help and you you don't know, but you look at it and you say, man, I'm healthy. I think that you have the faith that you're going to do, it, and that's what he wants you to do, is to get out of your comfort zone, talk to that stranger, help that person. It's going to be good with you, but it takes your faith. Yeah. And when you approach them, you don't know what they're going to be. You know, they might be a grouch, or they might be so, so, so happy that you help them. I tell you, I can do this myself. I know I get angry. But two, you can kind of change your life. They, they may be having really a bad day and they needed someone to show them some kindness. Right. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we, we are blessed by you. We may not always feel the fireworks go off in our faith journey, but we know that you are leading us. Give us that faith, the faith to do the things that we don't always want to do, Faith to say a kind word to a stranger. Reach out a hand to someone that may need it. God, we just thank you for the blessings in this life. Our family, our friends, our faith community. God, we just lift to you this day those that those that may be hurting, those that have lost, God. Especially we pray for the victims up and down the coast of the hurricane, the tragedy, the loss of life. Bring a peace there, God. Restore. Lift up. Continue to help rebuild. God, we know there are people in our lives that are hurting. We just ask that you heal their pain, whether physically or emotionally or spiritually. God, we especially lift up those that this church has put on its prayers, those people that we lift up to you in our hearts. Just ask for your continued blessing. God, there are times where 
who just don't know what to say. And in those moments, may you hear our hearts. When we find time in our day, we hear your small voice as it guides us and leads us. May we always have a faith that depends on you. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Well, thank you all. Good stop. Yeah. <laughs> I started to say that last week before. I was thinking, <laughs> oh, yeah, it was. I mean, I was in that moment.